Welcome to Census Conversations. Census is Scotland's innovation centre for sensing, imaging and Internet of Things technologies. Census normally holds lots of events throughout the year, gathering people from across industries to network, debate and share ideas. However, of course, the challenges we've all faced around COVID-19 has meant we've had to hit pause on their regular event schedule and find new ways to engage with their communities. So while you may be unable to attend a Census event right now, they have found a way to bring it to you in a new online discussion panel format. Our conversations will touch on engineering, technology and innovation from the viewpoint of technology developers, service providers and of course the end users. We're going to be looking at examples of what's happening in the sector right now, challenges businesses are facing and how sensing, imaging and IoT is being used to help overcome technology barriers and of course transform organisations. So for this conversation, we're going to be talking about some of the cross-cutting challenges around transport and logistics, exploring how technology can be used to create smart, connected, integrated, and of course, sustainable transport networks that benefit both operators and service users. Hello everyone, welcome to Census Conversations. Uh, my name is Gemma Milne, I'm a science and technology writer and today we're going to be jumping in to this brilliant topic, planes, trains and automobiles getting mileage from sensing, imaging and IoT to deliver a smart, sustainable Scottish transport system. And I'm really excited to be joined by four wonderful guests. Uh, before we kind of get in deep to the topic, I wonder if each of you we could go around and do really brief introductions. Cade, let's start with you. Hi, my name's Cade Wells. I'm one of the business development managers at Census. Thank you, Steve. Hi, yeah, I'm Steve Cassidy. Uh, I am a director of Fuse Mobility and co-founder is a startup in technology. Brilliant. And Tom? Hi there, I'm Tom Rafferty. I'm head of innovation for Coefficient IoT, uh, looking at innovation, digital transformation and leading edge IoT technologies. Thank you, Tom. And finally, Amy. Hiya, I'm Amy Ferguson. I'm a Senior Project Officer at Aberdeen City Council, working in the Smart Cities team. And I'm also the Project Manager for an EU-funded project, Civitas Portis. Thank you. Thank you guys for all introducing yourself. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about planes, trains and automobiles and talking about transport and logistics and specifically how we get mileage from sensing, imaging and IoT. So Cade, I'd love to start with you. I wonder if you could just give us a bit of a, a view from the bridge, give us a little bit of scene setting around this sensing, IoT and imaging space specifically within transport and logistics. Census is the Innovation Centre for Sensing, Imaging and IoT based in Scotland. We help both private and public organisations overcome challenges using technology to help develop new products, services and processes. And often these processes are bringing about transformational changes within the organisations. We've delivered over 200 projects to date and increasingly we are seeing interest in projects in the transport and logistics space. Thank you for that, Kate. So let, let's kind of go around the room. Um, Steve, I'd love to, around the room, around the virtual room, shall we say. Um, Steve, I'd love to start with you. So I wonder if you could get, tell us a little bit more about, about what you guys are doing and how that feeds into this, this new thinking around how we do transport and logistics. Sure, yeah. Um, so we work in an area called uh, mobility as a service, which is all very exciting. Uh, so most people have heard of software as a service. Uh, so mobility as a service is something that's sort of newish, I suppose, and that is the idea of moving away from owning something like a car, which sits on your driveway quite a lot, to being able to... Uh, have a service subscription to all your mobility. And so we at Fuse, we, we basically within one app can... Uh, allow you to plan, book and pay for all of your travel, multimodal travel uh, around the cities and different areas. Uh, and it's, it is really getting, aw getting away from that ownership, which is quite, a, quite an archaic model. You know, so why should you always have a certain type of car on your driveway, which you never use, whereas you can get a whole blend of things that really work for you and your family and this real complexity of people's lives. It's really about making people's life simple with technology and transport's very messy and dirty. Amazing. It also sounds like personalization comes into that too, about being able to kind of uh, utilize the, the resources in the world for each individual, for each individual's um, specific circumstances as yeah. much as possible. Exactly. You know, let, let's get something that works for you and your family in that moment. And so you can travel easier, better, because really using 
uh, a blend of modes. The car is very easy. You know, you've got your car keys. Um, it's not easy for everybody, but you know, it's generally an easy mode. Uh, but if you're going to try and you do multimodal travel, you know, it takes um, it takes a lot of cognitive awareness. It takes awareness. You know, you've got to know what's out there. If you haven't used a bus for years, you know, how do you how do you actually know what's running, how it runs, how it works, what the etiquette is, what the tickets are? Um, you know, there are in Scotland. I think there are three hundred. I did look it up. I look at my piece of paper. Three hundred ninety three bus companies in Scotland. Wow. Um, Fifty five million different. Types types of tickets on UK rail. It takes a lot of cognitive, physical, economic uh, acuity, I think, to be able to use it. It's just to make it simple, make people aware of what options work for them. Exactly right. Personalization, 100%. Amazing. Lots in there about information handling as well, which I'd love to, to dive into in this conversation. But for now, let's move over to, to Tom. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, what you guys are, are focusing on and how you kind of think about this this new world that we're that we're in right now when it comes to transport sure, logistics. Yeah, because in terms of uh, some of the IoT technologies that we're working with just now, uh, and again, integrating that with telematics. So an area that we are focusing on just now, particularly with a couple of companies uh, in Scotland in waste management and with uh, a lot of fleet management companies. So through transportation and logistics, we're covering things like fleet and vehicle tracking up to the second uh, GPS tracking on the, you know, on HGV um, you know, vehicles from driver safety, compliance, you know, including things like predictive maintenance, uh, operational efficiency, and, and even through to things like route optimization. So this is a, a system where we're integrating back end into ERP solution for all the, you know, the job management and the financial side of it. But we also have live telematics, including things like geofencing, where we can calculate very accurately things like time on site, for a particular vehicle, the vehicle draws up to a particular location on site. He's on there for a duration of period. And the minute or the second that he leaves that geofence, there's an automated bill that's sent back to the back to the client. Now that's in terms of you know building in the efficiencies into the process. Now the other things in there is looking at some of the job management where we can feed a range of, say for instance, 200 jobs per day and the route optimization software will then coordinate that to in cab, you know, it will, you know, triangulate to the particular driver. He will get his plan on a mobile device in cab, and it will give him proper route optimization and obviously looking at the directional details, you know, to, to the to the end customer. So it's a it's a whole integrated solution, you know, including the things like telematics, route optimization, and back end ERP solution. So that's where we're looking at, you know, building these three platforms, you know, together to have one. Uh, it's like almost one application where we have one sign on and the manage, you know, fleet managers have, you know, everything at their, you know, their fingertips. Because the key thing we're working with some of the main dealers, uh, say like Volvo, for example, you know, on things like diagnostics. So we've got over there diagnostic information that's going real time to particular, you know, the the maintenance teams so we can categorize the type of defects that potentially are coming up and this is where we look at ai and machine learning for predictive you know predictive maintenance for vehicles and that has a big impact on you know looking at making sure that the fleets are in best health possible uh, so there's a whole range of things and we're moving into areas like using adopting iot sensors within the you know within the vehicles themselves so that we know the capacity real time of particular tankers so that we can route them, you know, accordingly. So there's a lot of technologies that we're, you know, putting into one system that gives the entire, you know, gamut of, you know, fleet telematics, as it were, you know, for for any transport and logistic business. Yeah, there are definitely lots of uh, lots of themes around there. Again, around uh, information management, putting information, putting data to use, um, but also about optimization. So we'll, we'll definitely come into some of those themes. Amy, I want to come to you for our final sort of deep dive into into what you're doing and and what the kind of current state of things looks like for uh, for what's happening in Aberdeen Transport and Logistics. Yeah, sure. So in in the introduction, I mentioned our project Civitas Portis, which is a EU funded project, which looks at sustainable mobility solutions in port cities in Aberdeen, of course, having a harbour situated to the heart of our city centre. As part of that, there are several measures that we're doing, which involves like technology and data and the use of that. Uh, but one of the main measures that we're looking at, which is really exciting for the city, I believe, is the development of a smart journey plan enough. It's not quite a mobility as a service solution.
ambition quite as yet, but it definitely is a longer term ambition to become that. But in the first kind of early development of that, what we're looking at is the integration of data from various different sources and how we can use that to potentially be behavioural nudges to encourage individuals out of the private vehicle and onto more multimodal um, uh, journeys. But as part of that, you've got to have a a whole range of active travel infrastructure improvements at the same time as that. Um, Just when I'm hearing the conversation, I just want to touch on another bit of really innovative work that we're doing as part of the city, not as part of Portis, but as part of ED. ERDF, um, the Smart Cities, uh, Scotland's eight city work, um, Aberdeen City Council, we looked at intelligent street lighting. So and as part of our procurement, we had to focus more on the communications network. So we um, deployed LoRaWAN gateways and through those gateways, we can actually control nodes on each of the street lighting columns. So it is an intelligent street lighting project, but actually it's a much wider project than that because we've got sensors. So from the smart belly uh, bins that we have, and we've got waste as well, um, uh, air quality uh, and flooding are all connected onto that central management system. So that's another Another really exciting project and just goes to show the innovation happening in the city right now. Amy, I'm going to stick with you actually for the next question <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll, we'll get back to get the, the views from the others as well. But I think something that's been mentioned in all of these kind of intros and views from the bridge is this idea of trying to integrate many different physical systems, informational systems, different kinds of people and different kinds of jobs. And with your role, obviously working, you know, representing a city and representing the the people of that city as well, what do you sort of see as the difference between the opportunity that all these different technologies are bringing versus the reality of perhaps the challenges of of starting to implement? What are you kind of up against right now that you see as something to, to still have to work on? Yeah, so what's been challenging is smart technology has been quite new to me and the development of a smart journey app, like having um, developers behind us who are giving that support has been really um, helpful. But what I find challenging as an officer is getting around the privacy notices, the governance around it, the data, the GDPR. Uh, And for me, that's been quite challenging. You want to supply a product that's going to be helpful for your citizens, but you've got some maybe some institutional organization barriers that you've got to come across first, especially for something as new to it as for me. Um, so that's been quite an interesting one to, to come across. And I hope going forward, especially when we come to AI, that transparency, that ethics in the data is going to be um if, if we've got a checklist or toolbox, for example, where were some of the first officers maybe in the um, in the council to be developing this sort of thing? So having our best practice now that we can now share with colleagues or other cities and organizations is really helpful. Um, I want to come to both Steve and Tom for this one, because if there's a lot of discussion about, you know, with new exciting technologies, innovation and whatnot, we we often look to to startups or to agile companies, companies that are able to to dive into these, these new technologies or create these new technologies and then sell them onto the market. And of course, with, with some kinds of technologies, you don't necessarily have to integrate with these huge sort of social systems, um, again, both physical and informational. So I wonder if you could both talk a little bit and um, maybe Steve we'll start with you because I know you've already worked with Amy up in Aberdeen about what it's like from a company perspective how to innovate quickly you know do all the sort of feel fast and all these ideas that we have around innovation but at the same time actually implement at scale somewhere like an entire country like Scotland yeah that's a good question um I think the I think that innovation and that agility is um yeah we 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 came out of fuse mobility came out of being the r and d division of a larger organization a transport services company and it's been great we're a little bit like uh, Pitpon is released at being able to you know really look at where the really try and discover where that user value is and being able to understand what problems and everyday life problems we can solve. And go, going back to Aberdeen, Aberdeen's a great example. So the contract there is very much built around uh, user engagement and design sprints and co-creation. And okay, we've got a platform and we've invested a lot in the platform and that brings together all this messy data that we're talking about. And we can, through a front end, can make it all very legible. But you know, the, the great transport system of the future isn't going to be designed by a load of 
transport people sitting in a transport room talking about transport it's about talking to, to people about their real life so we've gone you know through with working with amy we've gone through uh two or three or f- four really it depends how you define it different co-design sprints talking to people from a range of backgrounds and talking to them about the travel and then trying to say well what are the real features that will make a difference to your lives so that, that that's been good and then the scaling bit so that's the agility bit getting close to users that's been really exciting um the other thing about the scaling question is a good one. So we we ourselves have a platform um, which can bring in data. Uh, that data, as I say, if there's data available, and it goes back to write the early questions about um, from everything from remote sensing to urban traffic control data, which is something that we're getting from Aberdeen. If we can get that data into the platform, uh, we can then, in other cities that have similar approaches or there is open data that's available, which we can maybe talk about it later, the Transport Bill in Scotland is making that more more available. You know, we, we can then implement in other places, and we've learned from, from one place to another. And so there's lots of things, for example, that we do with National Rail, which will apply to whichever city or region we work in in the UK. There's other things that are a little bit more localized. And I think the last thing on that, I think I would say is it's always about um, one thing that we found very early in, in Aberdeen was that we can be better than Google Maps if we are personalized and if we are localized. And yes, you can get the economies of scale with a big platform, but you've got to make it relevant to people and their city and their region and their lives. And so it's that simultaneous level, I think, in terms of upscaling that you need. Yeah, it's interesting that kind of um, having to think about scale when you're talking about uh, an entire city, entire country, but at the same time about that localised knowledge, I guess it's trying to get the balance uh, between the two. Tom, I'd love to come to you to kind of talk a little bit about that from a logistics perspective, because, you know, for the sort of everyday people that are going about thinking about um, travelling around a city or commuting or whatever it is, um, sort of supply chains and and getting things from A to B is not always necessarily what, what first comes to mind, but it's obviously a, a deeply, um, you know, a huge system, complex system with lots going on. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit again about this idea of the, the sort of opportunity versus the the implementation and what have been some of the challenges um, up against you guys. Sure thing, Gemma. Yeah, because I, I think one of the, the kind of key things we always kind of use the kind of mantra of, you know, think big, uh, start small and scale fast. You know, one of the key things that we're always looking at is to get quick wins very early in terms of the project. So that gives us the confidence, you know, in terms of the teams that we are working with. So say, for instance, uh, when we're looking at, if if we're looking at transport and logistics, when we're looking at, you know, HGV drivers, for example, how do we onboard them in terms of the technologies that are available now? You know, they're going from pen and paper to, you know, even going into mobility, you know, use mobile devices as part of their everyday, you know, day-to-day workings. So one of the things where we try to make sure that they're onboarding, they understand everything that we're doing, you know, in terms of the technology, we bring them in and we start, as, as we said, we start it small. You know, we give them confidence that we can, you know, we're listening to, you know, what their issues are and how we address those. So the key thing that we found as part of the drivers, and this is one one of the areas that we touched on, is in terms of driver safety and compliance and a whole range of, you know, some of the new, uh, shall we say, some of the new reports that's coming in you know, that's available from real-time telematics and all the different systems, you know, is to bring them, you know, through a driver training program. We call this ADAS, which is an assisted driver, you know, training program. And and what that's got is we have things like uh, in-cab video technology that's monitoring the performance of the driver. And one of the things they've got a lot of fears about, you know, you know, spying the cab and all this kind of, you know, some of these, you know, with these new technologies. But the first thing we found is that, you know, first issue, there was I think there was an accident, you know, happened in one of the vehicles, but the driver was immediately exonerated because there was a real time video that was sent to the insurance company to say that driver was not at fault. So the, the driver was then saying, wow, it's. I've just made, had so much paperwork to fill in, you know, in the past. It would have been, you know, the blame was normally given to the, you know, HGV driver. But in this case, it was very clearly that the driver was not at fault. So that was an early stage, you know, example we had with putting cameras, you know. And, and the, these cameras have got 120 point facial recognition, you know, built in so that we can detail where the driver is, you know, whether he's not attentive. Uh, so all these technologies are supporting the onboarding with, you know, with some of the, the implementation programs that we're looking at and, you know, adopting the, you know, telematics technologies uh, in place. I suppose then it's, oh, sorry, on you go. 
Uh, no, the only thing I was going to touch on was the next stage of that was, was looking at driver gamification. You know, where we have uh, driver scores on their performance, like harsh braking, harsh events, uh, even down to like speeding and fuel efficiencies uh, and, and even things down to like crashes. So each th there was like a driver scoreboard and this is all available in the driver app. So one of the things that we found over the course of the last three months is, you know, the performance in driving has got a lot better, shall we say. There's been fewer incidents, fewer accidents. And again, the insurance premiums have got a knock-on effect as well. So that way they're saving up to 10 to 15% on insurance, you know, because of the systems that's in place, because that's an operational efficiency and it's cost saving for the business. Amazing. I think um, there you're touching on some really interesting points around, uh, we touched already on privacy and on information and kind of what, what we're all happy to to allow into our into our system. So like, I want to touch on that a little bit um, next. But before we do that, Cade, I want to come to you because obviously your role is in some sense a bit of a connector role and an enabler role, connecting together the, the government, the local governments, the companies, the innovators, the universities. And again, when it comes to this, coming up with new ideas around technology, we can we can talk about the opportunities tons and say, look, we could put this sensor in here, we could do this, da 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 da, da. Um, And of course, that is part of the this kicking off, we have to ideate. But when it comes again to implementation, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about perhaps one or two of the projects that, that you've worked on. And again, what this what this looks like in terms of marrying um, these innovations with realistic um, kind of problem solving in, in the real world in cities. Certainly. So part of the, the challenge for uh, organizations who are looking to develop new products uh, and services to address challenges is actually that link to end users. So in part of what we do at Census, we bring together collaborations between technology solution providers as well as end users. Um, but we also work directly with the technology developer to develop these solutions. So two examples are of um, uh, project that we've worked on um, uh, are around the optimization for fleet management and logistics hubs. Uh, we worked with one company called Fuel Link, who were looking at optimizing the refueling of vehicles, whether that be vans, buses, lorries, or indeed cars. And they worked with us to develop a solution, which they brought to market called Vinny. And this solution enables a vehicle to approach a petrol pump, for the petrol pump to recognize that vehicle, to recognize the driver. It downloads information from the onboard computer within the vehicle about how many miles the vehicle has done, the, the level of fuel within the fuel tank, and dispense the right fuel, the right quantity of fuel uh, to that vehicle. Now, where that, that is an advantage is it's automated. So there isn't the manual input, there isn't the requirement for filling in paperwork uh, and that human uh, interaction. Um, but I suppose the other really useful benefit is that you are understanding how your vehicle is using that fuel. Um, so it might indicate there's a problem with the um, the vehicle that might need some maintenance or whether maybe fuel's been siphoned when it's on the road. So the, the, there are these other benefits as well as actually speeding up the process of fueling the, the vehicle. And the, the other area which we've looked at uh, recently is around 24-7 um, logistics hubs where there's this real interest of getting lorries into a bay filled with, uh, with, with pallets, with products on and then out again as effectively and as safely as possible and this is where we were we were aware of uh, solutions which would be used for smart um, parking solutions within cities uh, and we were aware of a supplier of this technology we worked with a supplier and an end user a logistics company within scotland to trial these smart parking sensors within um, parking bays they were designed predominantly for sensing cars so the first question was can you detect a 22 ton lorry uh, within within the bay and did it have the right uh, resolution so you could actually measure the amount of time it spent within the bay and how could you really that to the driver as well as the fleet management organization um, to improve the operation to get that smoother interaction from when the vehicle entered the the, the depot uh, to when it left so that's just two examples but where i think it's very exciting for for census is where we bring in other partners other organizations where we have both public sector 
commercial and also academic partners coming together to, to solve challenges. And this is where Census is looking at some of the more fundamental challenges we have in um, being able to effectively identify people, the type of vehicle in changing conditions within urban and rural spaces. And we funded uh, projects within this space, but also uh, in areas where we're trying to understand that flow of people through such a diverse built environment that we have within Scotland. And this is understanding how somebody gets from A to B effectively, how you can understand the journey that they're going through, but without infringing on on the privacy of that individual. And this is where cybersecurity and cyber resilience and the trust and privacy aspects that Amy touched upon um, come into play. Yeah, so let's let's talk about about data because I think there's there's quite a lot to talk about data. Specifically, I guess it's at the root of everything we're talking about. That's the, it's the fuel at the center of uh, of all this. So you know, I think on one hand, um, you've kind of got the, the the questions around privacy and having to balance um making things useful and being able to kind of supercharge and optimize and all these sorts of things um with possibly infringing on on particular kind of rights or people not necessarily knowing what they're giving access to. But also on the other side, we have a, a huge sort of technical challenge around making sure we've got good data, clean data, uh, data that, that's actually relevant and who owns it and all this sort of thing. So Amy, let's start with you because I can imagine in your role, you must have to think about so many different elements of this, uh, shall we say, data life cycle. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, about how you've been working with it. Uh, so what we do at the council is that if every any time we were thinking about collecting data, we have to have a use case. So we've got to have a clear purpose as to why we're collecting data and how it's going to be used and the data ownership, like you say. We would probably also do um, some sort of um, paperwork, a governance around that as well. So like a data privacy impact assessment. So that kind of goes to our data protection officer for approval. Uh, and we go back and advise it as and when we need to do that. But like you say, there's a lot of data that goes around. Um, we've got an open data platform that we developed as a council as part of the ERDF um, Smart Cities program as well. So that's to encourage innovation um, out in the public and, and what, you know, there's other organisations out there. So as part of the city region deal work, we've got a digital working group and some of those partners or they do um, engagement sessions with the public. They can use that sorts of data sources to bring about those innovation and new products and services in the city. Steve, I want to come to you because you obviously started off by talking about all these, however many it was, 300,000. Uh, <laughs> I don't even remember you were throwing numbers at me and it seemed like a lot. And I think that's kind of, you know, part of it when we come to talking about a lot of these future technologies it is wrestling with with data from all different sources, trying to somehow match it up, uh, data from one company with yeah. another council and so on and so forth. So I wonder how, how where are we in Scotland um, when it comes to our kind of, cleanness of data or usableness of data yeah. as it were um i i think there's um the new transport bill that was passed uh last year in october it will will improve things in terms of uh, data provision from bus companies the bus companies figure which i which i mentioned 393 bus companies so um you know they will there'll be new uh, requirements on all the bus companies to provide different levels of data so so that's good i mean uh, scotland isn't too bad you know we can get data which exists and you know we integrate information from google from travel line uh, and we, we just make it more more usable but then there's other information sources so the aberdeen example is a good one in that they um their urban traffic control data we can bring that so real-time parking data for example or um, events on the network we can bring that into the app so so somebody has something that they can they have trust and confidence in the information and the app and that is providing that's that's a good service i think that that's the key i mean they're, they're the words that we always come back to in most of our discussions is trust and confidence trust and confidence with the input information trust and confidence with the output information and the overall service and you know if that doesn't exist um you know we, we haven't got anything we implemented a service for young people um a couple of years ago something called navigogo which we co-designed with um, young people from young scott a national charity in scotland um 
and it was really to help people um, when they got to a certain age not necessarily own a car so that they could use maybe get a driving license and use car clubs but basically not necessarily own a car and one of the things that we spent a lot of time with with young Scott was their five rights five rights about data for young people to know what information to give out and what they should expect and making things very very simple because we spend a lot of time on terms and conditions and privacy policies but we've got to make it really accessible to people and that that was a you know a very good example of you know improving trust and confidence in the service and the other one was actually in Aberdeen we were talking to the youth committee in for Aberdeen City Council and one of the things that came out very strongly was for that personalized information um, if 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 people can within the apps that we develop and with our platform we have personalization modules where you can enter a little bit of information about yourself and then you can get the very personalized price so if you've got a national rail card or if you if you've got a concessionary pass or if you're of a certain age we can tell you what peak and off peak means to you you know how much it will cost you for that trip and some people, the, the young people in the youth committee said, people can use it for without registering all that data. But if they register that data, they can get something fantastic back. And they said, please make sure that people understand the value of registering. Please get them to know that uh, because it would be so valuable to us, particularly as everything's changed post COVID and there's a lot of uncertainty on the network. So again, it's trust and confidence to put your data in and trust and confidence in getting that data out and how you do it from privacy policies to making those things easy. And also how you encourage people to actually use these services with, with confidence really. So I was about to say we've gone almost, uh, what, about half an hour without mentioning COVID, but you just did, Steve. So that means we're going to have to talk about COVID as the, the next part of our discussion. And um, and Tom, I'm going to start with you, but I, I want to hear from all of you guys. Um, obviously, working in the logistics space, we all know it's like supply chain has kind of had its, its moment in the, in the news, I think, at the moment. Obviously, people really realizing how interconnected our systems are and how dependent uh, they are on uh, or interdependent they are, rather. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about... Um, um, possibly some of the impacts of, of COVID on poor on, on the sort of area that you work in, but also how you've been able to utilise technology to a kind of keep going during the pandemic, but b sure. start to build new systems. Yeah, sure. Because uh, I, I think initially it was uh, bringing you know drivers back to work, you know, in a safe environment, because uh, that was one of the key issues. How do we onboard you know dr drivers back in? to be safe when they're actually on site as well and to give that confidence back to the end customer that you know they're you've basically been tested so one of the first things that we'd implemented as, as part of the onboarding process was temperature scanning uh, and one of the things <clears throat> It tied in with, uh, you know, the, it's all about integration. So what we had was a temperature-based uh, uh, scanning camera that was linked to, it was almost like a kind of clock-in system, but not so much as, you know, monitoring for that purpose, but it was more so, and it was through Retina Scan, where we're doing temperature monitoring. So they can even use their masks, for example, but still have temperature, you know, temperature testing. That was all time-stamped, and it was all available on the driver app. So the driver can then, when he comes on site, he then has got a sign notification to say that this driver is safe. You know, he has been tested. So that was the first kind of part of the process that, you know, we'd implemented. The next part was through uh, the mobile app technology where we had, we brought in sanitization checks as part of vehicle inspections. So through this thing called DVIR uh, uh, process, where we had built a mobile app for the drivers to do his daily checks. But one of the key things was about the sanitization of the vehicles to ensure compliance on that so that the fleet manager has awareness that every vehicle in his fleet has been going through the proper checks and, you know, regulation, uh, you know, ag agreements uh, to, to get people back into a safe environment. Because one of the things is you would have vehicles where they may have a change of driver and we want to make sure that, you know, we're compliant in terms of those changeover processes. So it was putting an integrated temperature scanning process and also looking at how do we adopt the mobile technology to compensate for COVID, you know. And again, we put in some cleaning processes you know, through some of the new technologies for that as well, you know, in cab uh, sanitization, uh, as well as, you know, monitoring. And again, it was all back to data. So we had actionable insights as part of, you know, the reporting applications and dashboards, you know, within the platform. So that came back and the fleet managers can, you know, can check one of the drivers missed an inspection this morning, you know, he would actually not allow that vehicle out of the yard. 
And again, we can all do that through geofencing. So through the technology, if a vehicle had not had its sanitization checks and left the yard, it would be there would be an alert, an SMS message that would be sent directly to the fleet manager. And we've one of the technologies that we've got in the cabs is is live um, text to speech within the vehicle. So the camera has a speech module so that we can communicate directly with the drivers. Uh, and that was one of the key successes because, in fact, the company we were working with in terms of wastewater were one of the first companies to get back, you know, to become profitable again, you know, to actually get his full fleet up and running within a week. Uh, and he was back into profitability. I think one of the big things you're talking here about um, is, you know, reacting to what's happened and making sure that people can get back, that companies can survive. But I also want to talk about, um, you know, obviously putting aside a lot of the horrendous stuff that is happening as a result of the pandemic, but thinking about particularly with public transport, the opportunity perhaps that this pause of sorts is giving us to maybe rethink how we how we design, how we do things. Amy, I want to come to you to, to hear your views, obviously, from that city perspective. Yeah, well, I just wanted to kind of touch on um, quickly is that for, in Aberdeen, we have the Spaces for People project. Uh, like many other Scottish cities, we've got funding from Sustrans to implement uh, various different measures uh, to help the social distancing. So as part of the Smart Journey planning tool, uh, we're looking at a how-to etiquette. So we already had one to make people feel more a bit more comfortable um, about, you know, confident about taking public transport. But now in light of COVID-19, it's more about the etiquette. So wearing your face mask, like the juice maybe timetables if um the, the capacity on buses as well so like you're saying about the public transport so um so we're doing that incorporating that hopefully into the smart journey planning app and we're hoping to launch it soon as well it's not fully undergone all the testing that we maybe wanted to because of covid but we've been thankfully doing a lot virtually for the co-design sessions to make sure there's there's progress in it. Um, but because of the tie-in, because it could be a really useful tool for individuals in light of COVID, we're hopefully bringing that forward. Um, and we've also maybe got some advertising space uh, within the app as well. So what we were investigating at the moment is the potential to offer advertising space for businesses. So not only is that a journey, to, journey tool, but it could lend itself to help support maybe the business recovery side as well and local economy. And um, culture team at the council has been in touch with us as well. If we can maybe t- potentially offer virtual walking tours. So again, mm. trying to attract people back into the city. Uh, but going back to your question, how this can maybe um I, the way I see it is maybe more demand responsive and, and going back to that whole connected vehicle side of things. And as a city as well, we're, we're laying the digital foundations. There's a lot of connectivity. Uh, we're investing a lot from the city region deal into that. And um, so it all brings together maybe that connected side and people could maybe have a, a bit more of a demand response if they needed a public service, but it needs to be probably more of a bus occupancy and again that's a call we've had with Transport Scotland we understand what they're doing and we're following that Aberdeenshire Council who actually hold that bus data but it's looking at the data format that they hold that and how that can be integrated into the journey planning app because that's something we potentially want to do in the longer term as well so there's quite a lot of things in there to think of um, and um, we have a, a northeast bus alliance partnership as well so that keeps dialogue going between the local authorities with the bus operators and our regional transport partners too so there's a lot of exciting things that could happen but as an individual myself probably what I don't want to do is be touching um you know machines so contactless payment we've already got that in Aberdeen but again it comes back to that mass solution reduction of touching machines and so on that that sanitization that hygiene well more hygienic because I think it's going to be a changed world going forward I think you're spot on is bringing in mass as possibly being and connectivity as you say and managing demand as being something that I think at the moment we're we're more doing out of need and we just have to use these technologies in order to get back going but actually it might possibly I hope accelerate uh, some of the interesting innovations and opportunities that we've been talking about Steve is this um is this what you're seeing on the ground obviously working uh, with mass every day Amos spot on with, with her comments and you know what we've been finding uh, I, I do think that there's um there's now an increased focus on you know I I've spent most of my life trying to get people to use buses and suddenly people were told not to use buses. I just started a journey planning company, which wasn't probably the best time to start a journey planning company. Uh, so I was a little bit uh, nervous about a few things. But I, one thing that has come back very strongly is that 
in in these times we just have to encourage people to think and to plan and again to give trust and confidence and so if the services like in Aberdeen and some of the other services that we're putting out if people can can use those services to think about what options are available and to know where there may be some problems and the etiquette is, is spot on, as Amy said. I, I think that's just a basic fundamental need. We're doing three services on our platform there. One is for the NHS, and obviously that's important, uh, about making sure that people understand what services and what etiquette exists and how to get to, how to get to hospital. The other one is uh, for Lot Lerman and the Trossets National Park, and some of the issues that we're looking at there is in terms of car parking, uh, particularly we'd be in interest in real-time park, car parking and understanding where the hotspots are because obviously we've all read about various problems that we've had in you know in open spaces and then the other one is a, is a college at Dundee and Angus College and that is to help people to get get to college better and, and easier uh, particularly if they don't have a car and with that there's obviously a lot of change in terms of going online in terms of uh, whether or not you need to come into the college when term starts and people will be traveling much more flexibly so then so stop, think, plan, understand, particularly if you're going to some of these big site attracts and then think about how you're going to pay. You know, we, t- I think the overall transactions now on, on transit, well, in the UK, 10%, there's only 10% of transactions in the UK that are actually using money. Um, at, there's a push in bus, well, in, in generally in smart ticketing now to go to, um, usually you have a, a monthly pass or a weekly pass. It's going to be much more, um, Pay as you go, there'll be a push for that and using contactless payments. And so that is something that is important in terms of the offer from the public transport company and indeed the, the mass services as well. So changing ticketing, changing people, how people are living their lives. But fundamentally, it's the same thing. Stop, think and have the right kind of service and be be prepared for what's out there uh, with trust and confidence. Awesome. Kate, is there anything you want to add on that and this uh, COVID point that we're discussing? I think for me personally, and if I if I look to to my family, it's it's about thinking about journeys um, differently now. Uh, thinking about a, a wider range of options that we feel the most comfortable with. Um, I have a personal preference not to use the car to use the per, uh, to use public transport, but now it's also looking at actually cycling, for example, uh, and bringing that into to. Um, my family's life more on a day-to-day basis of getting around rather than just purely for enjoyment. And I think that's a very positive change. It'd be interesting to see how culturally um, this this changes our approach to um, to how we think about transport. So Kate, I, I want to stick with you because you mentioned it in your introduction. How can we think about sensing IoT imaging, the impact it has on transport logistics through a sort of environmental green lens? Wow, that's a, a great question uh, and, and a, quite a... a uh, a lengthy one, I think, to to answer, but um, let, let's uh, let's try. So, I think, in terms of um, IoT, one of the largest areas uh, and one of the early adopters of the kind of principles of IoT has been around environmental sensing. So, for example, looking at the quality of the air that we breathe in our urban uh, and rural spaces, and I think now it's a great opportunity to actually look at the technologies that are actually out there that can actually help to enhance uh, the journeys that that we do make. And just to think of, uh, of an example, you could use things like air quality sensing to understand um, hotspots within maybe an urban area where there's a high density of traffic, a high density of pollution, and maybe you're looking to reduce that level of pollution. Um, and you may redirect bus services, and you might do that in real time, for example, or you might redirect cars. But also you may provide feedback to to people who are walking, for example, through through that area that they might not want to walk through that particular area at that particular time. Um, so there's there's that real opportunity to actually feedback benefits, not just to people who may be using vehicles and other forms of transport, but actually just people who are walking and actually occupying spaces. So that's, a, a, I think, a, a good example. That's something that I know that um, many cities and towns have, have looked at adopting technologies. Um, but, you know, it could be taken, you know, far more. And again, I think for me, it comes back to the integration um, with the other systems that already exist. A lot of the technologies we can use Used to improve services around um, transport within our within our town cities and our villages um, actually already exist. It's about bringing these technologies together, ensuring that the data can flow from one place to another, that this data could be fused together to draw out new insights 
um, about the environment uh, and transport and how the two to interact. And that's where I think very much we see a very positive action in Scotland around open data, for example, and the initiative now of sharing this data, making this available, because it's engaging the public in in, in this uh, this discussion, but also enabling people to experiment, to come up with new ways to understand the environment and bring about new services that can have a positive benefit, both environmentally and also from a transport standpoint. I think Kay's absolutely on the market. It's so much more important. And in any project that we're, we're planning now, um, it's it's really around maybe a power in Aberdeen, which is our sustainable energy action plan, um, as well as our local community plan and what we call a local outcome improvement plan. So the environment's really top of the agenda. And at full com- council a few weeks ago, the energy transition was recognised as part of that and as part of the diversification of Aberdeen as well, away from you know traditionally the oil and gas, but to the low carbon kind of capital um, so the council has been investing in quite a lot into environmental projects um, like I say we've got the power in Aberdeen which looks at our carbon management basically and a, a lot of the um, portis has looked at the emissions of that so a big part of that has been um, looking at the traffic management so we did an upgrade or what, what I could be called as an upgrade of our CCTV to um, maximise or the efficiencies from the transport network and is looking at that transport um, signalling Maybe if things need to be rerouted around the city centre, like Cade was kind of mentioning, that stuff that we're looking at and doing at the moment. Car parking, dynamic car parking is something else that we're really interested in. In Aberdeen, there seems to be, you know, people like to go to a certain car park. They don't they don't mind if they have to wait in a queue, but trying to get that dynamically. So we, if we know that one particular area is really congested, can we move that to another area? Um, but again, if we implement other solutions like the Act to Travel Hard kind of infrastructure, we're looking at procuring a bike hire supplier as well. So there's a, a range of stuff that we're doing at the moment and including a low emission zone, we're looking into that um, and how we can use automatic number plate recognition to kind of enforce that as well. But a big part of what we're doing in Aberdeen too as part of the whole diversification is hydrogen. And um, I think Aberdeen's quite well recognised for the, for the advancements that we have in hydrogen technology. And as part of Portis, we worked with um, private sector partners uh, to to get that kind of last mile delivery. So we initially had the idea for um, a consolidation centre in the south of the city centre. And um, unfortunately, there wasn't much appetite to do that, but we could still take forward that last mile um, initiative. So we've got um, some private sectors on board I can't name them yet but it's really exciting to get them on board and for their respective fleets it's the first hydrogen diesel uh, van that they'll have so it's a, a real positive for the city and hopefully with time and more uh, funding because we've de-risked the, the technology as a council we can get more um, private sectors uh, on board with us and uh, we've got two hydrogen refueling stations as well so so we're laying the foundation and uh, we've got the EV charge points as well because we see it as a real mixture of technologies to to, well, to get that kind of environmental benefits that we're really looking for, as well as the economic side and sustainability. Yeah, and it's so it's so important yeah. that that local councils, you know, do invest. I want I want to go to Tom because I think one of the interesting. Um, sort of shifts in conversation around environment or at least from my perspective um when we're talking about businesses in particular is environmental concerns not feeling like this you know it's just something we do because we're a nice company but actually because it's going to save us money it's it's not just about sustainability of the environment it's sustainability of business so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you know when you're working with your various different partners and implementing these new technologies how conversations around um environment and whether or not the technologies really can provide business savings as well as a planet savings. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because uh, that's one of the, you know, in terms of the adoption of the technologies is, is looking at what the return on investment is. You know, you've got an initial outlay for the installation of the telematics, you know, systems and software integration. So there's an initial outlay there. But what we're looking at, and, and this is one of the things where we're working at cost calculators to give you an indication of, say, over a six-month period, you can get full return on investment back, you know, for the technology you put in place. And that that return is, is all about things like, you know, fuel efficiency, because that's a key component of, you know, looking at the telematics system. And this is where we've built things like fuel and energy efficiency reporting within the dashboard. You know, we're looking at, you know, things like the distance traveled, you know, and analyzed fuel efficiency against that, looking at the fuel used, you know, in a specific time frame, and obviously looking at those estimated costs, because the system can determine the cost of, you know, the transportation, because this is where it 
ties in nicely with route optimization because I know that particularly from an HGV standpoint, you've got restricted routes and you know low bridges and all this area. So HGVs predominantly would take out, you know, they would be consuming more fuel because of the distances travelled. But one of the things I'd like to kind of touch on is, and, and Cade mentioned this, you know, in terms of looking at the environmental conditions where we can do proper route optimization and route the vehicles away from, you know, heavy polluted areas. And, and that's a key component working with some partners that we have, that if we've got access to that open data, then we could feed that into the system to then become, you know, a cleaner environment. Um, but, but, but back on to the, some of the other cost savings. One of the areas that we've just installed recently is, for example, idle, idle time. And this is a key component of the driver, you know, efficiency and the gamification thing that I spoke about earlier. Now, what, what this, uh, in terms of true idling, gives us an indication is things called PTO, power takeoff. So one of the things is in terms of the wastewater industry where there is, you know, they're using pumps and motors and, and the vehicle is idling all that time to supply power. Now, one of the things is we need to understand is when those motors and pumps are in operation and we can connect directly to those to see whether, yeah, the vehicle is idling and the pump is on or is the driver just, you know, idling for idling sake? And that's been a key component in terms of how do we reduce, you know, uh, carbon emissions and obviously overall looking at, you know, costs within the business. So they're the key components of some of the new reports, you know, that are, are now available. We've now got them within the platform and they're now been actively using in terms of getting back to that return on investment and cost saving from the initial outlay. And Steve, I want to come to you uh, finally to kind of uh, give us your thoughts on the on the environment question too. And particularly, you know, you've mentioned quite a few times in the discussion about the importance of users. And I wondered um, if the sort of role of, you know, being personally more responsible when it comes to um, the environment and your choices around transport has kind of come into play when you've been doing these, these user groups and the, the sort of building this business that you have. Um, I, you know, I think that people want to do the right thing. I, I don't ever doubt that, ever. Um, uh, but people need to know the options and need to know what the difference will be that they will make by doing the right thing. Uh, and fundamentally, in terms of transport, they have to be able to get to hospital or get to college. <laughs> you have to be able to live the lives. So if we can enable both, so allow people to make the better, a better choice, that, that's, that's the way forward. And I think in terms of the environment, one of the things that we have found is, I mean, it goes back to, to Cade and his family and cycling, and you know, there's some real opportunities now, I think. Um, I know from some of the work that we did in Aberdeen, actually, it's interesting how people, there's a high demand for... Um, understanding where good air quality was so that you could walk or cycle through that area and, th and that you know that's feasible there's a whole range of different people who cycle and we talk to a lot of mammals you know the middle-aged men in lycra and we talk to a lot of people who are you know completely new to cycling and not confident and there'll be a lot of people like that at the moment generally when we've been talking to people it was the non-confident people who, who wanted I want somewhere where it's safe and quiet and I can take my time. Whereas the mammals were saying, well, actually, I get to work in 35 minutes, but sometimes <laughs> I do it in 34. And so it's a, it was a different kind of offer. So um, I think presenting the information in the right form to different people in different ways to allow them to do the right thing and recognizing that everybody's different. And I think it comes back to where we were in terms of personalization. If I could set my confidence level as a cyclist and be presented with a route to go for my confidence level, that would be absolutely spot on. I think, I mean, this whole conversation comes back to, you know, sensors, imaging, IoT. It gives us lots and lots and lots of information. That's the, that's the crux of these technologies, right? And if we can find ways of connecting up that data, presenting it in a way that's useful, utilizing it in a way that's both optimizing as well as um, good for the environment and whatnot, it's empowering everyone, whether it's businesses or councils or individual people. Um, and with that, I want to ask uh, one last question, which is kind of looking, looking forward to the future a little bit um, when you think about the future of, of transport and logistics uh, looking into your, your crystal ball I would love to see what, what each of you see so I'm going to start with Amy uh, I think there's going to be a massive change especially after Covid to, to towards um, 
the the cycling and the walking and the real focus kind of on that. Um, and I think it's going to, this is a total change of pace maybe of life as we start working from home a lot more. I think this whole COVID situation has just accelerated us possibly like 10 years or something like that. Um, you know, and, and in a personal life, um, I always thought I was going to live city centre, but I just bought a house in the country you know, because I know I'm going to be working from home. And it was a lifestyle change. And I think that's that's going to be part of it because of cycling, more introduction, more cycle lanes. And I think at the same time, mobile is going to be king. I don't think, I think it's important to the member to be inclusive. Um, and that's something that I've really learned from the, the development of the Smart Journey Planning app, that that's still really important. But for future generations, it's the mobile, it's been connected to their mobile and been able to do things on the move. So that whole mobility as a service, I think is really exciting. And I'm really hopeful for the Smart Journey Planning tool. I think, I think it's got a lot of potential for Aberdeen and the way it can go. So for me, that's the future. And I'm really excited to have played a part in it. And um, yeah, I think it's really exciting and positive for Aberdeen going forward. Amazing, Amy. Tom, what, do, what are you seeing in your crystal ball? Uh, in terms of the technologies is the adoption, obviously, of IoT uh, within to, to, to drive efficiencies and cost saving. I think cost saving in terms of the current environment is probably the key thing for business. And the looking at ways, how can we save costs? And, and that's all driven through actionable insights. It's all about getting real-time information into the business to make sure that they're making the appropriate decisions. Because just now what I see in the industry is is back in the dark ages with pencil and paper, and they don't have that information at hand, you know, to make informed decisions. So I see like the adoption of things like, you know, sensors in the vehicles, which we're, we're gaining a lot of momentum in that space just now. You know, so we've got real, real-time diagnostic information coming in. We've got tachygraph information coming in, compliance, safety. Uh, there's a whole range of, you know, technologies that are available there. Uh, and again, one of the things that we're working on in next phase is looking at, say, for example, you know, load sensors within the tanks to give that. And that's just a kind of small snapshot of the technology that, and what's available and where you can drive these operational efficiencies going forward. But I think ultimately one of the things that we're looking at is in terms of electrification. How do we get EV vehicles on the road, you know, in terms of, you know, the zero emission policies? How do we start driving that forward? And again, that's the kind of the, the new area, you know, new space that we're, we're looking to drive forward. Well, I think uh, I would definitely agree with Amy and and Tom. Um, I think there's the the changes that affect us personally. Um, I think there's the the empowerment that IoT um, and the greater adoption of IoT by businesses, public sector, and by people can bring. Where you have uh, that choice of how you you uh, move from A to B. Um, the positive effect on actually health as well taking options of cycling walking uh, as an alternative to the car and, and the positive environmental impact i think the um, point that tom made in terms of greater adoption of iot i think we'll naturally see that as companies look to be leaner more optimized and actually be more competitive not necessarily just purely in a local market but also in an international market and um, tom briefly touched on um, electric vehicles i think what will start to see as well is greater interest in um, electric vehicles particularly for last mile delivery um, applications uh, we'll see that we've started to see that already within our um, our urban spaces but where I think it's quite exciting is when we start to see the technology continue to develop to the point at which we start to see deployment in the rural space and that the the business models around EV actually adds up to to achieve that and again potential environmental uh, impact from a very positive standpoint at least locally for the adoption of ev for that kind of last mile delivery in those areas yeah it definitely comes back to that sort of making sure we have the infrastructure there to allow it to to expand beyond just urban urban spaces which you can get a little bit caught up talking about in these in these discussions uh, steve finally let's come to you what are what's in your crystal ball right now national governments uh local government uh and organizations have all been to agility and resilience boot camp um, they've all had to gear up and intervene and do something. And it's been a really, really, really tough journey. Um, and I think there's been lots of lessons learned. But I think the one thing that has happened, because they've been to boot camp, they're going to be much fitter and more ready to actually intervene and do something when there's another you know, crisis or a local COVID or issues around Brexit or other environmental issues that come up. And I think because of that, they they want to connect more to organizations through 
you know, platforms like Tom through to the public, through platforms like our own, and enact policy. And I think now, particularly given that we've 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 pretty much gone to a publicly owned transport network now, um, because of all of the subsidies that are going in, and there's going to be more need for bang for the book. So it's right, what can we get out of the system? You know, what can we learn? How can we enact and keep that feedback loop of learning, which I think all of us have been coming back to. So I think that agility is something that a, a more empowered uh, public sector and organisations to do something about problems that are out there and use information to achieve that. I think that's going to be the new new reality. Awesome. I think that's a brilliant a brilliant point to finish on. It's not just about the shiny new technologies and, and all of the kind of questions around that. It really is about mindset shifts and, and moving forward with that open-mindedness as well as that armed with the, the, the feeling that you actually can do things, even though it might be new and difficult and all that sort of a thing. Um, so thank you to Amy, to Tom, to Stephen, to Cade for, for joining us today to chat about planes, trains, automobiles and all the technologies that are enabling the future of transport and logistics. Thank you very much for joining us in this conversation. I found it absolutely brilliant to hear that these things are actually happening in Scotland. We're not just talking about innovation and technology. We're living in really exciting times, it seems. So if you enjoyed what you heard or if you have any further questions where you think Census may be able to help, perhaps it's a project you're planning right now or a challenge that you have in this space, or you just want to find out more about what they do, please feel free to reach out to the Census team by visiting the website at census.org.uk where you're going to find all the information you need about how to make contact. Thank you for joining us. Mm-hmm.